Yeah, I want to thank the folks at Cal State Northridge for inviting me here, to be here. When the book was fun, I just said, well, I'm emails and invite myself to come give them a talk on this subject. Well, some of my friends thought they were spam and never answered me. Others of them thought it was a good idea and brought it up to their apartment and the apartment thought it was not a good idea. And still others uh, found out that the provost didn't think it was a good idea. So uh, it's actually quite a courageous thing for you guys to host me here because there are a lot of people in the academic community who want the debate to go away and just don't want to see it go away. Don't want to have anything to do with it. So uh, here I am giving a talk on uh, the great evolution. So I guess my first question is, how many of you here think that science and uh, religion are incompatible? A few. Okay. So um, we'll see what happens. Let's see if you change your mind. Okay, one of the interesting things about human beings is that we actually have two senses of reality. When we experience something, like things that are around us, objective reality. We reconstruct that within our minds as how it occurs to us in terms of thoughts and feelings and emotions, and that's our subjective reality. So we actually break reality into two forms, objective and subjective reality. The theme of my book and of this talk is that science is the study of objective reality. It's the things that we can observe, can measure, or weigh. Religion is a study of subjective reality. It's the probing of the spiritual realm that currently lies in physical reality in period of meditation. Now some people say there's an objective reality to religion. There absolutely is. Jesus was obviously crucified, right? By the name of uh, Saul of Tarsus obviously had a conversion on his road to Damascus. The Buddha obviously was um, Enlightened under the Bodhi tree. But the experience of religion is totally secure. So, with that view, science and religion are complementary ways of viewing the world. The apparent conflict comes with absolutists on both sides, insist on viewing reality entirely through their own lens. So, before we go any further on this, I've got to define terms. One of the big problems in the science versus religion today is the people on both sides are very sloppy in the way they use the terminology. So what is science? How many of you here are scientists? So you probably know what science is, right? It's the study of the physical dimension. And it's based upon naturalism. Until the, the whole view of naturalism arose, science didn't develop. And naturalism, simply put, is the belief that all physical phenomena have natural causes, and that careful observation of the phenomena can reveal its cause. Now, naturalism is a very poorly defined term. So I'm going to go into a lot of detail to talk <coughs> about naturalism and how we view the natural world. I just said there's a natural explanation for physical phenomena. That's how I defined naturalism just a moment ago. There's another way that people use naturalism, and that is to say the physical world is all there is. So the uh, philosopher Richard Panic decided to give two terms of naturalism to make this clearer. We talked about methodological naturalism. That's naturalism requires a method to study the physical world, <coughs> as opposed to ontological naturalism, which is naturalism that says there's nothing to be on the physical world. That's sloppy, OK? I hate to use, have to talk about methodological versus ontological naturalism. Nat ontological naturalism is the same as materialism. There's nothing in the world besides material. Some people would define scientific materialism 
as being similar to methodological materialism, but if you look at the various ways it's used in context, it's very, very obscure. So I'm not going to use scientific materialism. In this talk, I'm going to talk about naturalism as there's a natural explanation for physical phenomena. I'm going to talk about materialism as the feeling that the physical world is all there is. <coughs> now, this is the talk on philosophy. Why the heck did I go to all this effort to talk about this stuff? That's because it's very easy to slide from naturalism into materialism. Materialism is atheism. So there's a lot of scientists around who feel that science implies atheism because they think that in order to have science work, you have to work with materialism and not with naturalism. Well, science operates with the scientific method. All of you guys know that because you learned that in college, right? <coughs> You've got a collection of observations and measurements. <coughs> you try to figure out how those things fit into a hypothesis. And you go experiments and test the hypothesis. If you've got a lot of experiments that have essentially held a hypothesis being valid, then that well-tested hypothesis would be theory. Now, the one thing that's very important here that is not often understood is a hypothesis, a statement, or a theory is not scientific unless one can come up with a way to test it and potentially be wrong. This is called falsifiability. But what it means is, if you can't produce a set of experiments that will falsify a theory, then you can't assume that the theory is scientific. The statement, the Earth is 4.56 billion years old, is a scientific statement. I'm sure I can find a way to show ways to test it. There's various places on Earth where you can go find rocks that are at least as old as 4.5 or before. But this statement, the Dawkins statement from his book, The Selfish Gene, that the individual is a selfish machine programmed to do whatever is best for its genes is not a scientific statement. It's a biological statement. It's one of the keys of biology today, but it can never be tested, and therefore not scientific. You can't find an experiment to test whether you are programmed in order to do whatever is best for you. Okay, so having defined science, what's religion? This is a very difficult thing to define. There are people who think that it's a very religious act to fly a jetliner into a building and kill 2,000 people. Um, and I'm sure that you could uh, find people who debate for hours as to which religion is, is the better way to live religion. I saw a bumper sticker once that said, there are many ways to climb the mountain, but the view from the top is the same. So what I'm trying to do in my book, and what I'm trying to do here, is to, uh, many people consider religion as to be the root that one finds the mountain. What I'm trying to do here is to find the definition for the mountain itself. Well, I'm not that smart, okay? I'm sort of just a simple-minded field geologist. Uh, so I can't define that by myself, but I found some nice definitions in the literature, which is compiled <laughs> by participants in the snowman's conference. And that's what I'm going to use for the definition. The Snowmass Conference is a meeting of, let's say, there are Buddhists and Hindus and various flavors of Christians, including Russian Orthodox and Greek Orthodox and Catholics and Protestants and Jews, various types of Jews, Orthodox and Reformed, they're American Native Indians that met in these conferences at St. Benedict's Monastery in Snowmass. And they came up with a definition of religion that fit all of their. The first definition is the world religion bears witness to the experience of ultimate reality. So we give you various names. Um, Allah, the absolute of God, the Holy Spirit. The key thing here is experience. How many of you had religious experiences? Well, what guys what happened? <laughs> the key thing here is that Religion is based upon these experiences. It's not believed in a bunch of fairy tales, as the neo atheists would do. Uh, the best literature I can find to describe it and describe 
accentuate the nature of the ultimate religious experience, and that would put us into a tradition. Remember I said that we spontaneously construct reality into objective reality, that's stuff that's outside, and subjective reality, the stuff that's inside of me. And that wall that separates the objective reality from the subjective reality is the ego. In this term, it's the Buddhist term of that construction of your self, your persona, that you construct inside your ego. Religious practice, be it contemplative prayer or meditation, <coughs> is meant to erode away that ego. And that ego disappears. Ultimate reality breaks through. In other words, ultimate reality is the recognition that you are no different than the experience of it. Well, that's a Buddhist thing. What about real religion? <laughs> well, here's what Rumi would say about it. Rumi was a Sufi. If you can get rid of yourself just once, the secret of secrets will become open to you. The face of the unknown, hidden behind the universe, will appear in the mirror of your perception. It's pretty much the same thing that I just said in many more words. Um, Thomas Merton, who was a famous uh, Trappist monk, said this, one of the greatest paradoxes of mystical life is this, that a man cannot enter the deepest center of himself and pass through that center into God unless he can pass entirely out of himself and into himself. Ultimate reality cannot be limited by any name or concept beyond description. And the best description of this, to get this across, is let's assume you grew up blind and decided, or everybody else was blind. Somehow everything operated this way. You made your way around by feel and touch and a very good sense of uh, hearing, uh, but you had never had vision before. Now let's assume that one day you get your vision. And you can see blue sky, white puffy clouds, and green grass. How do you describe that to your colleagues who are still there? First off, you don't have concepts of color. You don't have concepts of clouds. The experience is real, but it's beyond description. And this apparently is what happens to people who have deep religious experiences. They have deep experience, but it's beyond description. And as a result of that, religions have essentially developed ways to talk about these experiences in terms of allegory or symbolism. And the, um, they're essentially trying to point at this experience that's beyond description. A really good uh, saying about this is Zen saying, the wise man points at the moon while the pool sees the thing. Fundamentalists believe that their finger is the only one pointing in the right direction. <laughs> and atheists aren't even aware the moon exists. They think that all the fingers pointing in the sky are just plain stupid. Third definition is that ultimate reality is the ground of infinite potentiality and actualization. Our insights, creativity, inspiration is a result of our interaction with ultimate reality. They're not simply products of chemical reactions in our brain. And finally, faith is opening and accepting and responding to ultimate reality. In this sense, it will perceive every belief system. Another way of putting this is faith is not equal to belief. One of the big problems we have in the English language is that belief and faith have come to be synonyms for an actual. They're opposites. As Anthony DeMello, the Jesuit mystic, said, beliefs give you a lot of security, but faith is insecure. Beliefs solidify the experience. Faith is being open to the experience that's beyond description. Another way of looking at this was uh, written by Karen Armstrong said that belief originally meant loyalty to a person to whom one is bound by him. During the late 17th century, the word belief started to use to describe intellectual assent to a hypothetical and often dubious proposition. Okay, so I've defined religion, I've defined science. Let's get 
to a, a little bit of uh, evolution stuff. Unfortunately, my time is all up in the evolution stuff, so I'm going to go for very fast. I can spend a whole hour talking about all this cool stuff right into the evolution of the Earth, the Earth's atmosphere, and life have interacted over the last four billion years. Or so. But uh, at least to give you some sort of a timeline to show you how our evidence of the antiquity of the world is pretty solid. Okay, the, the oldest, the evidence of the Big Bang, up until about five years ago, we had very poor constraint on the time of the Big Bang. But about five years ago, NASA finished mapping the distribution of galaxies and stars in the universe. And then by back calculating, you could know the velocity of each of those things. Back calculating the velocity of these things, they found they came to a point at 13.7 billion. We've got very good evidence for the origin of the sun and the moon, probably best in meteorites. The age of the meteorites are 4.3 or 4.5, 6, 7 billion years. Well, that's the century from the breakdown of various radioactive isotopes their daughter products. They can use about four different atomic systems in one way Life appeared very shortly after the Earth got cool enough to have a geologic record. First metazones appeared about 600 million years ago. Then came the Cambrian explosion. Very quickly thereafter, we got fish and all sorts of things. These are very messy diagrams. There are only three things that are really important here. The Cambrian explosion, when suddenly in the geologic record, we got animals with shells, we got evidence of predation, we got evidence of movement. Um, quite suddenly, only enough geologists, I'm talking about 50 million years in the period of time in which it happened. For a long time, this has been a mystery. How did the kingdom explosion occur? So the creationists, this is one of the biggest weaknesses in the geologic record, because there is no explanation. There's a very good explanation coming out about now. Um, that this is the first time that the ocean floor is oxygenated. Creatures need oxygen to make collagen. Collagen is necessary to make muscles and attach the muscles to bones and shells. This was not a testable theory until very recently. Very recently, we've developed, not me, geologists have developed techniques to measure very, very small concentrations of stable isotopes transition metals. These are very sensitive to the oxygen pressure. And it's probably within the next four or five years they'll be able to come up with ways to test the Cambrian record explosion. Maybe within the 10 years we'll be certain that the Cambrian explosion just due to appearance of oxygen for the first time in the sea. Over about 50 million years ago, <coughs> years ago um, trees, insects, Amphibians, reptiles, and mammals all appeared on, on the Earth's surface. And bad day for the dinosaurs. 65 million years ago, big impact. What is now a government kind of wiped out the dinosaurs. I could go into great detail on this, but the key thing is that the findings of evolution are incredibly robust. All the findings of physics, astronomy, geology, here, chemistry, biology, genetics, microbiology, and even linguistics to support the history of life. Linguistics, it seems strange. But we can use mitochondrial DNA to show how humans spread out of Africa after about 160,000 years ago, and how many populations trends spread throughout the world. Trends from the uh, mitochondrial DNA fit up perfectly with the linguistic patterns of families and that languages, suggesting when humans came out of Africa, they were speaking. So, with all this incredible amount of information to support evolution, why are creation so strongly against the concept of evolution? Well, there's some, what we call younger creationists, who believe evolution can't occur because it doesn't, doesn't agree with the Bible. Well, St. Augustine, who's one of the fathers of the church, he wrote this about 400 uh, maybe, argued the Bible should be read as that one. And he said this, this is a disgraceful and dangerous thing for an infidel to hear a Christian, presumably given the meaning of the Holy Scripture, 
talking nonsense on these topics. But we should take all means to prevent such an embarrassing situation, in which people show a vast ignorance in a Christian and laugh at it to scorn. The same is not so much that I admit that ignorant person is deriding, but the people outside our household of faith think our sacred writers have such opinions, and to the great loss of those for whose salvation is right. The writers of our scriptures are criticized and rejected by the writing. This was written about 1,500 years ago, and yet, this is precisely what happens when creationists take the Bible as being written. Here's a comment from E.O. Wilson. He's a um, biologist from Harvard. So the uncomfortable truth is that two beliefs are not factually compatible. As a result, those who hunger for both intellectual and religious truth will never acquire both in full measure. Now, evidently, E.O. Wilson's never read things like Thomas Aquinas to show how intellectually challenging religion can be. But what he's reacting against is the attitude of creationists that the Bible trumps all uh, intellectual endeavors. So there, not all people opposing uh, evolution are creationists. Uh, some of them are Christians who are quite willing to accept the integrity of the earth. But there's several statements that come out in some biologists who uh, are quite um, antithetical to any religion by this one. The universe that we observe is precisely the property that we would expect if there is at the bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind pitiful indifference. This is where you're talking with the biologists from Cambridge. Or, there is no way the evolutionary process as currently conceived to produce beings that are truly free to make moral choices. That's William Provine and the biologist from Cornell. Another Provine con comment is, I see no cosmic or ultimate meaning in human life. The ultimate universe considers nothing for us either continue to expand and cool, leading to an extermination of all living creatures in the universe. We'll cease to expand and begin to closure, which will result in everything being crashed together in an unbelievably small space, obliterating all life. Humans are nothing in the evolution of process of life, and only a few individuals are remembered. These are not scientific statements. Remember, I made the point. Scientific statements have to be testable by some sort of hypothesis. These are scientists, but they're making essential atheistic statements that are wrapped in a scientific book. The big mistake that creationists and intelligent design people make is a response to the atheistic milieu in which evolution is used. They attack the facts of evolution not the materialistic premises of the theory is So let's take a look at this theory. I'm going to call it evolutionary materialism. Actually, uh, John Hawk, the uh, a, um, theologian from uh, Georgetown University, called it evolutionary materialism. And let's take the first premise. The first premise is that there's no spiritual dimension to life. Now, this is not written out this way, but if you look carefully at the in details of the to their uh, writings, this is quite clearly true. And the second premise is that evolution proceeds by natural selection. This is Darwinism. Therefore, first thing that conclude from this, the most important thing in evolution is the information carrying the genes. For some reason. The second thing is that evolution is not progressive. Now when I read this first time, I said, duh, what are these guys thinking? Because I think the fish is quite clearly less evolved than the human being. But what they mean is that something that is progressive involves an increase in value over time. And if the most valuable thing in evolution are the genes, then the genes don't care whether they're in a paramecium or a human. The form has changed. What's important being the genes has it. So evolution is not progressive. Evolution is a meet random meaningless process. Humans arose on Earth merely by chance. If you rewind the tape and play it again, the humans are not likely to appear. 
And one of the interesting things is that the Darwinists, see, well, evolutionary materialists, let's say, think that Darwinism can apply to cultural things, and they commonly apply it to understanding how religion forms, because to them, religion is a totally mysterious thing. Okay, one possibility is that God is a big daddy. Okay? All of us grew up as children. We had to rely upon our parents. And then once we got away from our parents, we still have to rely upon someone who's an authority, so God's a big daddy. Another possibility, which is written by someone who quite doesn't believe in the first one, is that shamanistic healing required people to be easily hypnotized so they could be healed. And this resulted in a God gene, which is a gene we call Bill. Uh, another theory is that religion rose as an act of coercion. The people who in power decided a good way to keep power would be to um, make a god so the god was always on their side. Another theory is that religion gives a group cohesion, and hence religion arose from group selection. Those groups that don't have a better cohesion could evolve better than the groups around them. Another one is that religion is a market decision to buy in it to it to get immortality. And the last one, which you're talking to, the religion is a mental bias that affects people's mind. <coughs> okay, throughout the whole discussion of um, the creationist evolution debate, very seldom is it mentioned that there's a third version of and the best description of it was put forth by uh, Pierre Tiongi's art, Pierre Chardin, in his book, The Phenomenon of a Man. <coughs> and as a result of that, I'm going to call this view of evolution Teilhardism. In Teilhardism, the first premise is that life is imbued by a spiritual dimension and is manifested in our consciousness. Well, you might say, wait a minute, we know. I think we know, that all we are are chemical reactions in our brain. This is Francis Crick. He's a, got a Nobel Prize. He must be very smart. The astonishing hypothesis is that you, your joys, your sorrows, your memories, and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of vast assembly of nerve cells in the So there's a whole field of cognitive science that looks at brains and looks at where your activities in the brain and try to relate that to consciousness. Well, I said at the very beginning, the science can study objective facts. It has nothing to do with subjective reality because they can't do experiments with subjective reality. What they're trying to do here is to turn subjective reality into objective facts by looking at the chemical reactions in the brain. But that's not the same. I said it's been creating neural activity in your brain to consciousness like using an oscilloscope to monitor the electrical activity in the TV and trying to determine whether you're looking at Hamlet or Gilligan's Island. So I'm going to go back to Teilhardism, okay, and I'm going to say yes, premise one is entirely possible. The life is imbued by a spiritual dimension that is manifest in our consciousness. The second premise is that evolution proceeds by natural selection. This is Darwinism. It's the same Darwinism you find in evolutionary materials. But if you accept these two premises, what happens to your view of evolution? Okay. The first implication is the most important thing in evolution is consciousness that abuses humans, and perhaps other than life form. It is not the genes. The genes are just a pathway to get there. The second thing is that evolution is progressive. The increase in neurological complexity in animals over time represents an increase in value because it provides access to consciousness. The third thing is a self-conscious being like humans was almost certain to evolve as evolution proved for all the evolution of energy fields associated with. So let's look at this in a little more detail. Huh? Life has exploited a huge range of temperatures on Earth. You probably haven't seen this stuff here in California. But in permanent snowfields, like in the Cascades, there are little yellow, I mean, red zones called watermelons. It smells like watermelon, it tastes like watermelon, I think you can serve trucks. Um, <laughs> called snow algae. Now, 
in the snow, there are ice worms that eat that snow out. The ice worms only come out at night, but in the glaciers and cascades, the population of ice mallet uh, algae are in the field. Now, on the other side of the scale, we have thermophilic bacteria that thrive at temperatures almost up to boiling. There's acidophilic bacteria that thrive in highly acid waters. The um, sensory take H2S and turn it into sulfuric acid and then off the you know, uh, chemistry that produces that and energy that produces that. And they're quite happy at pHs of one, pHs that would raise tremendous uh, wealth in their skin. And at least four times in their history, animals have evolved the ability to fly. That doesn't include humans involved the ability to fly without making So our evolution has allowed life to exploit a huge range of energy fields that's encountered on Earth. Nobody already said that. So the Earth is pervaded also by a spiritual field. It's not, is it not likely that life also evolved to exploit this as well? So the human beings only exploit a certain world. Fourth, evolution has profound meaning. It's not meaningless. It's, it has a profound meaning because it involves progressive opening of life to the spiritual dimension. And five, religion as it grows as a way to explain access to transcendent aspects of consciousness is not a virus in your brain. Okay, which theory of evolution is correct? Evolution of materialism for the You have a problem. Because neither of these are scientific theory. Because they can't be falsified. There's no way. You can go out and do an experiment to see which one of these is correct. The metaphysical paradigms, which means the veracity of these theories depends not upon the data on which they're built, but metaphysical insights that people bring to understanding. Scientists believe that the vitriol and the toxicity and the nastiness of the great evolution debate is caused entirely by the creations. <coughs> They're not aware that they contribute to themselves. The extremes on both sides of the evolution debate agree on one thing. That the theory of evolution is put forth by most biologists implies there is no God. However, we've seen the Teilhardism can easily accommodate the existence of the spiritual dimension to the fact of evolution. Which means that the premise that both sides bring to the debate is wrong. The scientists simply acknowledge that the scientific study of evolution can say nothing about the existence or non-existence of the spiritual dimension to life will change the nature of the debate. I suspect that if one put forth a very coherent, paganistic view of evolution to show how it's tied into a spiritual development. Many of the people who consider themselves creationists would be quite happy to accept it. But the younger creationists will not. They would not stop imposing the concept of evolution because basically their, their religion is tied to absolute, uh, absolute belief in the uh, Liberals need the Bible. But their arguments will be strongly undermined. Right now, they consider themselves the holy warriors serving as a bastion that is keeping secularism in modern life. But as science acknowledges that evolution has a spiritual dimension, the young earth creations will be seen exactly as they are. A fringe sect whose view of the Bible diverges substantially from that advocated by Christian theologians over the past 2,000 years and a sect that is trying to force the teaching of their view of religion into our public school. 